Mm-hmm. First, just want to say hi, Audrey. Hello. Thank you for for joining. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking in my mind. So, um, Shu Yang is is really wonderful because we're going very detailed through the process, and I keep you know asking her very detailed questions. I know. I know. Yeah. Let let, let me not interrupt you. So I would just no. No, uh, it's okay. It's great. Okay. Listening in. No, but I, I maybe I can extract some of the some of the bigger questions, um, you know, while while you're here here with us. Um, one that we were just starting to talk about is, you know, I'm generally in in participative processes. Um, it's always difficult to reach out to sort of underrepresented minorities. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whether it's people from racial minorities or people with lower education. Um, or sometimes women, or you know, less tech-savvy people. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious if you're encountering this, um, mm-hmm. and and how you how you're thinking about this, how you're trying to deal mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. these things. Well, I think the general principle is nothing about them without them, right? That's the, the like overarching uh, logic. So. Um, um, so I, I don't know whether you're talking about the Vita one process or the e-petition process. Yeah. Um, these are kind of two very different processes. But I, I think there is one commonality in that we try to bring technology to people instead of uh, asking people to come to technology. So if it's about a regional issue in the e-petition process, we actually go to the, the, the place uh, and have town halls and have uh, like interviews uh, with the local people before we even uh, start the online part or the live stream part of the process. In these processes, I think live streaming or any ICT technology is just a um, supplement uh, to the face-to-face and kind of rolling wave survey and other uh, well-known technologies for, for um, discovering stakeholders. Uh, and we never let the online part replace uh, the the face to face part uh, for discovering stakeholders. Uh, the other thing is that usually dis- disadvantaged people um, they can nevertheless um, get into the process if you uh, make it long enough uh, to accommodate for for time and if you also use a way that is more comfortable to them like in their natural habitat instead of asking them to to do PowerPoint presentations or whatever right so so just by touring around Taiwan uh, like I tour around Taiwan every other Tuesday and I go to indigenous places uh, rural places and so on and bringing with me a video recorder or even 360 uh, recorder and ask the people in Taipei to see kind of through my eyes uh, how it is like in those disadvantaged uh, places, how they're doing social innovation. I think after one or two such trips where I return every two months, but after one or two such trips to one uh, specific place, um, the people in central Taipei, they nevertheless have a feeling of how it is like uh, to be living in that place. And I think this kind of um, empathy building is also part of the uh, initial setting. Mm, Okay. Makes sense to me. Um, one of the um, the other aspect I was curious about, um, some from a high level, is that um, you certainly know this better than I do. That a lot of the people who are working in sort of participatory democracy um, work with elements of sortition, so randomly, you know, mm-hmm. chosen citizens mm-hmm. um, as a way to avoid electoral, you know, representatives mm-hmm. and to yes. capture by local interests. Um, what I find interesting in the case of We Taiwan is that in many ways you've chosen a model um, where you put stakeholders together mm-hmm. more than randomly selected mm-hmm. citizens, where you think mm-hmm. like, hey, if we get, can get the stakeholders mm-hmm. through a consensus say, you know, then, you know, that's, and so I'm, I'm just curious how you were thinking about this. Um, no, I, I think that's because we work usually with the career public servants in the administration rather than the uh, representatives from a parliament or a equivalent referendum 
process, okay. right? So for us, it's in the discovery process. If you're using the ideal double diamond um, um, methodology or analogy for, for all its flaws, it's still very useful. <laughs> it's just to say that we're uh, more on the first diamond and especially on the divergence part of the first diamond and just converge a little bit uh, more. But uh, most of the sortation processes are already well past the first diamond and they're trying to make a binding process uh, that, that results in a referendum-like decision power uh, at, the, at the very end of the, the double diamond process. And so I, I think these two ideas are complementary. The more, the more you're into the late places of the binding process that you try to uh, be as good as referendum, the more you will work with um, you know, parliamentarians and referendum people and sortition people, the more you work on the early stage where nobody really knows what's going on and is just discovering how things are going, the more you're going to the stakeholder side and the administration and career public servants whose job is to discover what's going on. So, so I think it's a natural thing that we're aligning more toward the administration rather than the uh, parliamentarians and the referendum people. But I think our um, results are nevertheless, our synthetic documents are very good informative documents for the second part of the diamond so that people can consider the options more thoroughly and make sure that all the options are valid and that people can live with instead of through a normal uh, referendum process where you end up being you know, yes or no questions that uh, alienates half of the population. So I think we are, we're providing valuable service to the second diamond is what we're saying. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That is interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that that perspective from sort of divergence and um, so would it make would it make sense like in the um, in the face to face meetings that you organize typically sort of after the polis mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, phase. POLIS is just a you know crowdsource agenda, right? But we still exactly. talk through the agenda. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there, like in the invitations that you do at that stage of, for the face-to-face -face meetings, mm -hmm. is there like um, are there a few seats reserved for just ordinary citizens, people who don't have a particular stake mm -hmm. um, in the, in the conversation? Well, if they offer as much as one comment, they, they declare themselves stakeholder. Uh, so, so I think it is it is what we call open multi-stakeholder model. Uh, anyone becomes a stakeholder just by showing up uh, and say, I have this thing to say. <laughs> we were not saying that you have to be a stakeholder because every other stakeholder consider you one. That would be a closed or invitation only stakeholder model. Okay, I got it. So if, if in, in the Polish conversation, you know, I'm not a. I might not be somebody that ha has been identified as a stakeholder, but I make interesting contributions and I show up and I. Yeah, the the top scored Uber X consultation contribution is done uh, by Arvin, who is a local Firefox or Mozilla developer, and he has no stake in the Uber <laughs> consultation other than as a someone who are interested in public policy and uh, transportation okay. policy, right? So he is very much a hobbyist, uh, but then he's able to propose the one that was the most resonating um, comment. So, so I think the stakeholder really is a very vague term, right? At some point, a participant become a part contributor, but it doesn't really need a membership card from anyone. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, is that that wasn't clear to me? Um, I'm, I'm curious with what you just said before about, you know, the the general principle of you know we we bring technology to the mm -hmm. people, not the other way around. Right. And, that ICT is just sort of a supplement to to face to face. Yeah, it's what we call assistive civic tech. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm curious about this limitation that you have so far, and um, about only doing V one for digital cases. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and if that's the case, you know, are you are you ready to lift that, or are you considering lifting that limitation? Um, well, I, I mean, v is a community endeavor, so if the community feels ready, then I'm sure that um, people will eventually graduate out of it. But I, I think um, what, what's currently, which seems like a very useful, even politically um, useful dis uh, distinction to make, is because with digital issues, usually the public officials 
really doesn't know it better than the civil society or the community. And with digital issues, there's no clear、um, solution that's the best. And also with digital issues, usually there are solutions that work for everybody's benefit and nobody's detriment. It's not zero sum; it is innovation based, right?、Um, but with non-digital issues, especially very old issues that are more like a resource allocation and more zero sum in nature,、uh, it is less clear that we can always come up with a Pareto improvement and that is the win-win solution.、Uh, it is. Much less clear that if it fails,、uh, the zero option will still be available. It is much much less clear that、uh, somebody that like a minister is is willing to、uh, hold the political repercussions if the consultation falls, right? But but with the digital, it's it's none of this is a concern. So so I think just by you know declaring it's digital, it provides a safe space for the community to experiment. But with the participatory officer network, we're often tasked with Exactly such、uh, zero sum games, <laughs> and、uh, for quite a few cases, we have to make a very clear line between like the rights of fishing and the rights for the fish to renew on a marine、uh, like a national park. But for these kind of cases, it's very much not clear that a multi-stakeholder process can always generate win-win solutions. And so, at the moment, we have the participation officers absorbing、uh, this more non-digital kind of、um, political issues, and for the digital kind of issues, be kind of a safe ground for the community to explore. But of course, all this can change in the future. It's just the political convenience at this point. Okay, I get it.、Um... Uh, something else that we we talked about、um, just before you joined、um, Xuyang was the question of the、um, sort of the resource the resource constraints. So、mm. one of the things that you have in、um, electoral representation is that、mm. you know Parliament, you know, all these people only have so many hours and so、mm. so many things that they can discuss.、Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it's one of the topics I I see discussed very little.、Um, Of the problems we with current democracy is is just、mm-hmm. the severe bottleneck.、Mm-hmm. You know, if Parliament is busy here in the U.S. discussing,、mm-hmm. you know, re- changing the you know, to tax cuts,、mm. then so many other valuable things cannot be discussed、mm-hmm. because you know all of the attention is just on this one particular、mm-hmm. topic.、Mm-hmm. And and what we V Taiwan or similar processes offer、mm-hmm. is sort of bottlenecking.、Mm-hmm. Um, Of the system, because in theory you could run quite a lot of these processes in parallel. Oh yes, and and we also part of the things that we talk about help passing is this whole idea of sandbox loss, where、um, yeah. for AI banking or very soon this week for AI mobility,、uh, AI banking is already、uh, part of the law here. Uh, uh, we have a fintech sandbox where anyone can challenge existing regulations and laws、uh, when it pertains to fintech and break the law for six months. There's some limitation. You can't experiment with money laundering or funding the terrorists. But otherwise,、uh, you can challenge many other laws and regulations. And a multi-stakeholder panel, just like V Taiwan, gets to discuss this、um, AI banking or whatever blockchain innovations、uh, throughout the six months or one year. And at the end of it, co-determine whether it's a good idea for society or not. If it's a good idea, regulation and laws、uh, get changed. If laws take time to change, the experimentation can extend to up to three years.、Uh, and for AI mobility. We're doing very, very much the same. Also, so what I'm trying to say is that we're we're kind of getting the legislation to sign off this blank check, but not to the administration, but to this kind of multi-stakeholder model, so that people can experiment with breaking laws a little bit, but in a controlled risk fashion, and so co-create the law. And I totally agree that it is a way to kind of parallelize、um, the legislation process, so that it's the bottleneck does not、uh, always become the throughput of the the parliament. It is a little bit like how in the Bitcoin world the line. Network、uh, or an other off-chain、uh, methods kind of、uh, works around the, the transaction limits of the main blockchain、uh, that is、uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Yeah, and and so we we're then discussing with with Shu Yang what what is the current sort of resource constraint、mm. of We Taiwan. So currently, there's、mm. something like you know six seven processes a year、mm. oh, yeah. through it and. Could you imagine this becoming sixty or six hundred? You know, is there?、Um... Yeah, what, what what we're trying to say is that Vita is very much just a a kind of research model, and all the process is open. 
and uh, currently there's multiple uh, multi-stakeholder networks being set up in Taiwan. There's the Taiwan Internet Governance Forum which is also trying a MSG uh, at the moment and the very fact that there's um, fintech mobile uh, fintech AI uh, sandbox and very soon AI mobility sandbox also says that every maybe even regional governments in the future will have a similar process pertaining to um, you know evaluation of the the fintech or the AI mobility cases so so I think while they may not call themselves so V-Taiwan in, in the Digital Communication Act, we just say open multi-stakeholder processes without saying it's V-Taiwan or anything else. Uh, I think this, as long as the spirit is upheld, we will be able to work across all the different communities sharing very much the same process and, and ideas. Yeah. Um, what would it take to, you know, to to increase the capacity of we Taiwan or mm -hmm. you know, to, to multiply that is it mm -hmm. is it a question of, of documenting it is it a question of training people is mm -hmm. it a question of the government putting more mm -hmm. money into it is it a question that some of the community mm -hmm. people get paid mm -hmm. for, well, for? well I think there's already a very, very much uh, V-Taiwan inspired and that they always call it so V something, right? So the latest one being the V New York City. Uh, and they, they, they try to replicate. And But I like uh, a philosopher called Tom Atlee. He said that uh, V Taiwan is just one particular configuration out of the Taiwan social uh, norms. And in other multi stakeholder networks, it would take other ways to manifest. So, so I think what, what's I think that the main thing that lets V Taiwan scale is not so much the particular political circumstances, but just the the what we call a recursive public, a, a self aware, uh, cross sectoral, loose partnership that uh, allows itself to be improved uh, every week or so. Uh, I think V Taiwan, even V Taiwan itself, has been rebooted at least three times with very different bunch of people and and I think um, that's what enabled uh, this idea to grow it's not uh, one particular political configuration but just this um, idea that it is possible to uh, establish useful synthesis of um, ideas in a way that is politically meaningful uh, through this cross-sectoral idea so I think documentation of course will help but what will also help is that in various very different political circumstances people try it out anyway and documenting their successes and failures and share it just like a sandbox. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious how how does the how does politics feel about about this? It, it it seems like you've managed to find yourself a niche in the mm -hmm. you know the digital side where That's right. it's threatening. Yes. Yeah, it's at, at the worst we're mostly harmless, right? And at the best yeah. <laughs> we we can solve very difficult problems. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, do, do you see a path a path forward for you know for this to become more more mainstream or for this to break out of that? Well, for non-digital, we already have the the participation officer network. Uh, and if the e-petition is not binding enough, at the end of this year, we're going to have the National Referendum Act, which for the first time we're introducing Swiss-style um, referendums. And I, my feeling is that eventually people will see that a proper deliberation before any referendum and for the kind of citizen, citizens council maybe sortation based and maybe multi-stakeholder based maybe the multi-stakeholder determine the agenda and the sortition determine the final synthesis will we'll try various models out but some combination of these models uh, that informs the final ballot what is put on the final ballot of national referendum I think will be a huge difference on the quality of democracy Right, so so I think um, we will converge, not exactly to the Swiss style referendum or Oregon style, but something along those lines. And I think there's uh, every reason to believe that Taiwan will uh, evolve a combination between you know the stakeholder, the sortition, and the referendum models uh, to have meaningful direct uh, democracy. And I think that is the obvious uh, like short term. Um, way uh, for us to scale to the, the nationwide, uh, but for many other uh, ways like participatory budgeting, participatory land 
use planning, participatory, uh, environmental um, impact assessment, or whatever. There are other people working on it, and they're often dropping by V Taiwan to share dinner. But <laughs> it, it, they they would not call themselves uh, V Taiwan contributors, but we nevertheless share many of the ideas. Um, what are some some other places outside of Taiwan that you that you see that excite you? I mean, it, mm -hmm. from everything I hear, mm -hmm. you seem to be you seem to be pretty advanced compared mm -hmm. to others, and others seem to be wanting to catch up. But other other places mm -hmm. that inspire you? Well, I think um, Estonia uh, with no legacy on paperwork <laughs> and, and no legacy on pre-internet bureaucracy, right? The constitution is literally written after the internet, <laughs> um, can can offer a lot, especially on the administrative side, uh, the XRO system, for example, and it's very wise handling, um, portable data and, and privacy and whatever, I think offers a much more um, advanced and solid way that we can still learn a lot like for example we started just last year to hand out our EID cards to, to foreign people, not Taiwanese people, but people with other nationalities. And we also started handing out aggressively ARCs and re-entry visas. Uh, we call it the 4-in-1 gold card. But um, it doesn't really get the same international visibility as Estonia with this EID card for uh, overseas uh, people, right? With the e-residency is over the world. So uh, I think we can learn a lot from its marketing at least. <laughs> but it's not just marketing, uh, but the general idea of having the whole um, uh, human population um, as as uh, potential constituents and stakeholders, and and not just Taiwanese people. I think there's a lot of this global thinking that we can learn about. Um, what is uh, what is next for you? What are what are you excited about? Like, what are the experiments that you're excited about right now? Well, um, so just tomorrow I'm going to talk with uh, legislators about the AI mobility sandbox. So I'm at the moment very immersed uh, into this idea of co-creating a nor norm, a social norm of co-domestication of safety and explainableness and uh, viewing things from an AI vehicle's viewpoint to kind of fuse the horizons of human population and a driving self-driving AI population. Uh, and I think that is one of the key areas that a lot of Shuyang's research on mixed reality and on um, chatbots and on other things can be put to use because if we are going to enter a, a self-driving vehicles um, world, we will need a lot of augmentation <laughs> to, to reason uh, effectively <laughs> and to co-create the, the AI uh, norms together. So at the moment, that excites me the most. And we already got tremendous interest from Uber, from NVIDIA, from Google, from Microsoft. Um, they want to participate in this program because frankly speaking in Asia there is nothing comparable going on and we cannot roll this out unless we're pretty sure the multi-stakeholder consensus works in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. That's interesting how you're building on the existing things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like Lego blocks. Yeah. Um, um, one thing I'm, I'm curious about is um, you know this, this question of Legitimacy, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, people argue for ever and ever on the smallest details of um, any political process, you mm -hmm. know, in the constitution, and and in your case, you're running this, these cases like V Taiwan, mm -hmm. with just a bunch of people who show up, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> and who are willing oh, yeah. to, 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 you know, to do this, yeah. and um, and so I'm I'm curious what makes that. So far, you have been considered to be legitimate mm -hmm. parties. So I, I know of some of the history, mm -hmm. you know, some of the sunflower movement and mm -hmm. what, what gave initial mm -hmm. legitimacy. But right now, um, when you run a new process, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's in, in V Taiwan, you know, what gives mm -hmm. this process 
legitimacy. Oh yeah, uh, I think when we're explicitly just doing it in the brainstorming stage and not the and even just the ideation, it's in the first diamond. It's never in the later part of the second diamond. Uh, we don't need that much legitimacy, right? Um, the only thing that we need to prove is that we're not partial uh, to any particular interest. That our facilitators are as neutral as can be. That our weekly meetings are documented uh, on the publicly readable place. And so basically, just like how Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, the Internet Society, gets its legitimacy, right? Because the Internet Society is also a bunch of people who happen to show up at a special interest group. And the, the Internet Society, by and large, get by by having the process well documented, by having radical transparency, by live streaming and using mailing lists and wikis to keep everything, and by being held accountable by a collective sense of responsibility. That's where we get the idea of recursive public. And I think um, because it's in the brainstorming stage and it's on things digital, uh, it will not be challenged by existing representatives because they know that there's always a chance it becomes a law for them to go over it in a parliamentary debate if they they don't, and often they don't, they just pass whatever that, that we hand them. <laughs> but in, in some other cases, they do go over it and review it, but armed with the knowledge um, that is explored by the multi-stakeholder model. So the legitimacy, I think, is derived by us being an alliance to the representative uh, democracy and not positing ourselves as a replacement. That's the first one. And the second is that by having the public servant see this as a um, signal generating and not a noise generating process, because otherwise they have to run public hearings anyway, and they often collect lots of noise uh, without proper facilitation and stakeholder discovery. So it's seen as an improvement of the existing public hearings and whatever they already have to do anyway. And so it's a process improvement for the administration and it's a kind of uh, a natural alliance on uh, fact gathering for the representatives. So I always say we're piggybacking on the two branches legitimacy by enhancing both and not um, taking anything away. So what you're what you're saying is that if at some point you would consider that the the output of a process, you know, becomes law by itself. Mm -hmm things would become trickier. Oh yeah, it so would be it become far trickier. Yeah. Or it still goes through the ministry, you know, to approve the regulation. And so they're still Yeah, yeah. The the ministry still finally the minister take the final responsibility. So they're free because the, all we and ask is that if they don't use any point of the synthetic document they, they answer why, and that's the only requirement. So it is from the outset it is a consultative process. Right, so it is not uh, what we say a binding process. The only thing being bound is the agenda uh, of the face-to-face -face meetings. And but that's not saying much. We're not binding the conclusion. Okay, so things would become a lot trickier if, at some point, you were to claim that. Mm -hmm. The outcome of what you do is binding rather than consultative. Uh, in which case, we will switch very quickly to random sample voting or any other sortation methods. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes uh, that makes sense. Mm. Um, I I remember reading a long time ago that um, some minister said that you know really all process in the future should be run. Mm -hmm. You know. V Vitae one way. There seems to be like regular yeah. sort of aspects of this. Um, yeah, it, it's it's done. I mean, uh, the, it's a watered down process, of course, but uh, every single regulation is now pre-announced on the joint platform, and every yeah. budget spending, even once projects monitored by the ministry, is updated at least quarterly on the joint platform as well. So, so yeah, the administration has fulfilled the promise. There's a lot of resistance from our participation officers a year ago, <laughs> but after a year of kind of pilot testing and they see there really is nothing lost uh, by having the public uh, review their KPIs, their budgets, their procurements, their spending, and their regulatory pre-announcements. So, so now it's part of the, the, the joint platform. We have 
1200 um, regulations, uh, sorry, 1200 uh, government projects, ministry projects, and hundreds of regulations at any given time uh, in the joint platform for the public uh, to comment and for the government to summarily respond in a synthetic uh, fashion. So, so yeah, it's not necessarily done in a face-to-face -face consultative setting, but at least the online part uh, that is has been fulfilled. Hmm, thanks. Um, the the point we Chu mm -hmm. Yang and I got to in in our you know detailed conversation mm -hmm. was sort of after, like if you know you go through a typical process, and I know that there is no typical process because every mm -hmm. case it's reinvented and rearranged. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was sort of um, after the um, the Polish process mm -hmm. um, when you get a number of people, mm -hmm. experts, scholars, officials, mm -hmm. you know, uh, participants together um, mm -hmm. on a face-to-face. -face. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, how, how do you, how do you decide who gets, who gets invited? I, I guess, you know, the, mm -hmm. the number of seats are limited mm -hmm. and that might be, you know, a place where your partiality might be put into question, mm -hmm. you know. Um, well, uh, actually, you'll be surprised because even if hundreds of people participated online, at the end, yep. only only maybe five or six people have the time to attend face to face. So we, we don't usually limit the number of community participants. Anyone who signs up gets to show up, because everybody knows it will be live streamed. A vast majority prefer to view it in their comfort in their home, uh, the live stream and participate by typing uh, to a channel, right? So so we, we don't actually, I, I don't remember deleting people uh, who want to show up in a face-to-face. -face. Uh, we usually make up for the missing people. And for some less relevant cases or less popular cases, maybe only two people or three people want to show up from the online community and we have to fill them up uh, using people from academia and so on, yeah. Okay, but I... Even beyond, you know, people from the general community, I could imagine that you, know, you invite two people from Uber or one person from Uber or three mm -hmm. or, you know, there might just be like a lot of these, these questions like, you know, how balanced are you? You know, there's like two people from the taxi companies mm -hmm. and there's like, you know, um, it, it, does that, is that a headache or? Well, there's a rule you know, of thumb, essentially. We, we don't invite two people if they are going to say exactly the same thing. So, uh -huh. so if there are two people from Uber, that's because one is from their legal department and one is from their maybe management or, um, you know, strategic uh, department and they have different things to say. Um, and, yeah. or, or maybe it's uh, Uber and it's a uh, lawyer who, who doesn't actually work for Uber. He's just advising for this particular case. Um, and actually, that's the same principle that we apply to the uh, collaborative meetings in the e-petition workshops as well. If there are um, multiple people wanting to come from one uh, NGO, uh, one civil society organization, or from one agency or whatever, we ask, do, do they have different things to say? And if they do, then of course, they're welcome, but if they are going to say exactly the same thing, we just invite one person. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the, the process of these meetings because I, I imagine that's really the place where you're hoping for consensus to mm -hmm. emerge between different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was, I was impressed. I haven't read the transcript yet from some mm -hmm. of these sessions. Mm -hmm. um, with Google Translate, I, mm -hmm. I, could, I could read. But for instance, I, I think in the Uber case, you mentioned that it was like a two-hour session. And yeah, but, 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 but it starts from the consensus, from the polis, and there are, the so, there are so common sense. And, and people yeah. see that already 94% of the population um, are for it or even higher. So unless people have a really, really good idea, it's very difficult to say, I don't agree with that. So the the polis really gives you sort of the head start and you know pu you know forces people into, into yeah, accepting very, very, very much so and like in collaborative uh, meetings in both V Taiwan and PO, we start with a briefing that summarizes what we already know and what are kind of undisputed facts. And that is very important in the focus conversation method because if people go through a period of not disputing facts, 
uh, usually they will converge on some common values. But if you start by having each side proposing facts uh, previously unrevealed to other side, then people start challenging each other's legitimacy, right? And and we we get nowhere. So so it's essential that we start from some undisputed parts. Yeah, and when you talk about undisputed facts, do you consider? Mm -hmm. The polish result to be an undisputed fact. Is that well, it, it, well, if if like ninety five percent of the people participating in polis does not dispute it, then it's very close to yeah. being undisputed. Of course, stakeholders showing up in the meeting can still dispute it, but so far nobody really did. Uh, it's very difficult to 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 do this actually. Hmm, that's that's interesting. Is there is there a particular um, facilitation method methodology that you use in mm -hmm. in these sessions? Yeah, personally, I, I use the focus conversation method, uh, and um, yeah, it's uh, what I also try to um, in lectures and also training workshops uh, talk to other facilitators. But m many facilitators have their own um, heritage, and we we are not fixed uh, to any particular uh, facilitation process. Um, what is the output of of these sessions, like is it a mm -hmm. is it a list of of items that should make it into the the, the bill drafting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so it depends. Uh, like for for example, the cyberbullying uh, consultation. At the end of it, it is the general awareness that. There shouldn't be a cyberbullying law. <laughs> uh, it, it, there, there may be. It may be good to have separate uh, policies or regulations or even laws on on maybe stalking, on non confidential images, on whatever. But bullying is such a wide term that it's impossible to derive a consensus. So, so having no consensus is a a possible outcome, <laughs> and and it, it may not be a bad thing, right? It, it forces uh, the stakeholders to kind of drill down to more detailed issues and then talk instead on those detailed issues because what we discovered that it's impossible to if the idea is vague it's impossible to get consensus and even if ideologically opposite camps if the specific case is specific enough then they can always generate some overlapping consensus so many of the stakeholder meetings uh, is about to clarifying and nailing down the typical cases uh, that we can argue about specifically and if it that is done during the face-to-face -face meeting then we generate a list of items as to say right there but sometimes it needs further refinement and then uh, more meetings are held like for the social enterprise and company laws interaction we ended up holding easily six meetings or something just to get to the very specific points okay so you the, the first meeting sort of drilled down the sort of to the specifics under the, the general mm -hmm. umbrella yes. of the topic and then you had specific meetings with the same sort of stakeholder group right 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 and group. and uh, sometimes we discover that some stakeholder groups are missing uh, and and then maybe we go and find these people. I, as I said, there there is just this meta process. There is no process <laughs> that is the same for each case. Yeah. Um, and are there other cases where, out of the stakeholder, like you come out with sort of a a list of things that can go to bill drafting, where you say like, hey, you know, it sounds like the Uber case was like that. Yeah, there, there's many cases that's like that. Um, the earlier VTOWN cases like equity-based crowdfunding uh, is like that. Uh, the closely held company law is like that. And of the later cases, uh, we also have the specific chapters uh, in the company law, like allowing uh, foreign uh, names of foreign aliases, essentially, of a registered company in Taiwan. At the moment, only Chinese characters count, but very soon you can also use Latin characters and, and maybe even Taiwanese holog or Hakka, but written in Latin characters uh, as viable alternative uh, company names because it's such a very specific domain we were able to get a list of recommendations right there in the face-to-face -face meeting and that translate directly into the law that is currently under debate and hopefully going to be passed next week uh, by the parliament today okay um, and so how does um, how does the, the next step work of the of the policy drafting because mm -hmm. I imagine that that's where the whole legalese mm -hmm. comes back work and where you know experts might take over 
and there's a whole risk of whatever has come down as, as a consensus not being mm -hmm. respected or being tweaked or mm -hmm. or even no it's, it's going to be tweaked anyway right if the consensus is fine enough of course the legalese people will not dare um, go against the grain but if the consensus yeah. is starts vague to begin with, then there uh, there's a lot of room for interpretation, and we see it happen both ways, right? So, so I think the the community is under no pressure to 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 release something very fine. But if we do release something very fine, it usually carries over to legalese very easily. But if it's something that is more on the general direction, then of course the the legalization process can take a lot of liberty. That's just the nature of things. Yeah, is there is there a process? Where whatever is drafted goes back to yeah, it's always posted back to V Taiwan. But at the second uh, draft review stage, um, there's still guarantee response from the ministries, but then there is no guaranteed face-to-face -face meeting anymore. Okay, and so when it's posted back to V Taiwan, what, what do you mean? Is it like on the on the V Taiwan website? Yeah, or uh, it... yeah. In in that topic, you always see a extra line that links to the draft and the online place where you can still comment on the draft. But there is no guarantee that it will result in a face-to-face -face meeting. Okay. Um, have you had cases where where the, the the things threatened to take a whole different direction than than what was discussed? Like, you know, is is there yeah? There's a need one for single there's a one single case that's like that. Yeah, it's the online sale of alcoholic beverages uh, case. And what happened? How did the community? No, the 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 the, the new uh, parliament came into effect, <laughs> and and so whatever consensus reached from from the previous cabinet and previous parliament is back to square zero. Um, the community reacted kind of um, badly, um, both in the open government report from the Open Culture Foundation, as well as yeah. from the previous premier, uh, Simon Zhang, as well as uh, from other people in the previous cabinets and parliaments. Uh, they all used that case as saying, you know, V-Taiwan is not binding enough because it doesn't, um, you know, survive uh, the change of uh, the cabinet and the uh, Parliament, and it's also one of the cases being made uh, by the one of the civic media in Taiwan, the reporter. They also used that single uh, case to kind of put uh, the meta process in question. So, yeah, I, I would say that that one single case uh, did more uh, to raise um, awareness of the brittleness of the the legal uh, status of the Vita One process uh, than any other case because for any other case it's just a degree of and and speed of whether it's taken into account but it's never the reverse but on this single case it is the reverse so it also spurred a lot of discussion about uh, whether we need something more legally firm for the Vita One's existence. Yeah. yeah. Um, coming back to the drafting, has there ever been? A sense that the community could be doing the drafting. Yes. Um, so for for some cases, the community has lawyers or uh, technologists, and so the recommendation end up looking very much like law. Uh, yeah. So and 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 that's um, and some of the cases where the community. Uh, version did not make it into administration's version, uh, the community were able to find uh, MPs and essentially port their version back to the parliament <laughs> by picking backing it on the MPs version. We're seeing that in the social enterprise and company law. So, you, I'm sure I yeah. understood what you meant by... So in the part one of the v cases is whether we put in in the company law uh, what what's called benefit corporation uh, and for the for the um, general benefit <laughs> of the society and environment in addition to for profit uh, motives the administration's version is the bare minimum of that uh, it is constituency clause it's the company may declare a public um, goal or purpose other than the for profit purpose but it's opt in and the company may announce uh, its charter or constitutional document uh, publicly using an open data platform by the Ministry of Economy, but again, it's opt-in. And there's mm, places where the lawyers in the community during the VTAL and consultation who came up with a more binding way, uh, like to be a benefit corporation, you have to at least release the public benefit reports and 
the publication of the charter or constitutional document is mandatory. It is not uh, actually uh, something that you can up in a year and up out the next year and so on. So it's much more lock in. Uh, that version, although not finally uh, picked up by the Ministry uh, of Economy, nevertheless find itself into the version of uh, MP Jason Xu and also MP Huang Guochang. And so just, just this week, they're, they're, they'll fight it out and uh, see which version finally <laughs> make it into okay. the final company law. But I would say that all the different alternatives has been explored and proposed during the veto and consultation. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so they, they, people from the community address themselves directly to some sympathetic MPs mm -hmm. to bring their version to the floor. Yeah, and, and I think that's a process improvement of V Taiwan. Uh, because after the alcoholic um, beverage over the internet, which did not involve MPs, uh, even if we know that there will be future MPs, uh, I, I think that uh, caused a change uh, in, pro in the meta process. And so for, for example, social enterprise or company law or whatever, we try to notice uh, the respective MPs. Of course, they, they did not came. Uh, the only MP that came to a veto and consultation is MP Karen Yu. Uh, but as a stakeholder, because she is a founder of a fair trade social enterprise. Uh, but <laughs> otherwise, the MPs usually just pay attention over live stream or send their uh, assistance uh, to, to our meetings and things like that. But that's still an improvement because then they can harvest the part of the community uh, non-consensus. Maybe it's still disputed, but they can harness it as their version uh, back to the parliament. I get it. Um, I... In the English-speaking world, the Uber case, mm -hmm. you know, is the case that has been most published or you know most oh, talked yeah. about. Yes. Um, and I'm curious, is is that because you consider it to be the most successful case? No, 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 no. because everybody see Uber as a headache. Uh, but okay. for for many <laughs> for many jurisdictions, uh, benefit corporation is already passed, <laughs> or they're not they're never going to pass it. <laughs> or or for many jurisdictions, yeah. that cyberbullying is already settled, or maybe they decided never to settle and so on. So uh, I think Uber is um, the thing that affects is a global epidemic. <laughs> so everybody sees the same problem at the same time. Where every other case, it requires some understanding of the Taiwan political context. I get it. Um, which would be the one or two cases you would highlight in terms of mm -hmm. you know this process just working well in the way that you know a more traditional process might not have mm -hmm. might not have worked. Well, I think like, the, tele the, the teleworking case really worked very well, uh, and uh, the few telemedicine cases also worked really well. Um, but I think. It means a lot to us, but uh, for um, like a jurisdiction like the U.S., where there is no restrictions against telemedicine or telework to begin with, uh, that will not make much sense. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more why why you feel this was an important one for? Yeah, I think the teleworking case is important because um, at the beginning, the Ministry of Labor always want to find a union leader, the labor union leader of teleworkers. And that's never going to work because teleworkers <laughs> work across all the different disciplines. A, a teleworking programmer would not presume to speak for a teleworking, uh, you know, uh, psychotherapist. It's a completely different profession, right? So, so uh, of course, that's not going to work. And then, then they, they change their mind. They think, you know, uh, people who set up their companies uh, using Kickstarter or other crowdfunding, maybe they have employed the most teleworkers because they're e-commerce e startups. So they try to find a leader of of the association of the internet startups and there's no such thing so <laughs> I think um, the, the traditional way of consulting stakeholders uh, from the administration always rests on the kind of representativeness of uh, industrial unions and associations and spokespersons of large industries and so on but that completely breaks down when you talk about telework which is a, a completely horizontal thing uh, that affects all the different industries so I think it really gives Vita and legitimate because it can reach people who are teleworkers themselves or their employers who employ teleworker, but they don't presume to speak to for anyone else rather than just for themselves, right? So the synthetic document at the end of the teleworking process 
it's really good because it has a section for journalists, a section for I I, I don't know, a section for bus drivers, a section for programmers, and and so on. And and they don't presume to to unify、uh, any of these considerations. I think it's a really、um, enlightened、uh, result, and it's messy from the Ministry of Labor's viewpoint.、Uh, but if they had had they used a traditional way and consult only the the people they know, it would end up fitting very well to those particular industry and、uh, nightmare for every other industry. So I think it's a very good thing,、uh, just from a, a public administration theoretical viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah, really switching from thinking in terms of representation、mm -hmm. to reaching people directly. Right. Which, right. 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 So, so to to representation, right, <laughs> for for people to present themselves and then record、yeah. it in full in context, so they can represent themselves、uh, along the way. Yeah.、Um, and is tel telemedicine case what? Well, the telemedicine case,、uh, I think, is also important because、um, it is has been a long、uh, contested issue. Uh, but uh, I think we started the V Taiwan process has been able to find、uh, psychotherapists as a kind of entry point, and which is very very wise because it requires no extra equipment, and、uh, also it is、uh, subject to a different set of law than medical doctors. And so we can start arguments、uh, from kind of a Blank state.、Uh, it is not like um, that. Um, a psychotherapist、uh, have to work、uh, in one particular location or particular equipment. So it simplifies、um, the arguments a lot. We get to、uh, instead focus on、uh, what equipment, what bandwidth, what kind of setting is good enough、uh, for diagnosis and things like that, which is the core of the telemedicine case. But、uh, if you start it from any other medicine discipline, then the relationship between the hospital, the equipments, and whatever. That that enters place and embodies the issue. So I think、uh, Vita One has been instrumental in having uh, the the uh, flexibility in the process for the research team、uh, and the law、um, lawyers、uh, to to kind of use、um, the telemedicine for psychotherapists as a entry point, a kind of a a beachhead,、uh, and before talking about the whole telemedicine and doctors' practice. And I think、uh, if not for this flexibility, these two different agencies within the Ministry of Health and Welfare would not really listen into each other because it's technically different agencies within the MOHW. But because Vita One allows the process to call in、uh, specific agencies as needed, right? So we were able to talk through uh, the the uh, mental health、uh, agency first, and then、uh, the wider、um, like general practice、um, the, the agency、uh, follow up、uh, after the clarification with the mental health agency has been settled. It, there's something that that strikes me about what you just said, and in general, like reflecting on on V Taiwan is,、mm -hmm. you know, how often the success depends on clever little hacks,、mm -hmm. or you know, you guys thinking about what is the best entry point and how do we get,、yes. you know, civil、yes. servants、exactly. to like this,、yes. and you know, how do we make them allies and. And、mm -hmm. how do we make a tweak on the commenting system so that、mm -hmm. people don't post pictures of their cats? That's right, exactly. Yes. So a lot of it is just you know thinking very cleverly around hacks and being and,、mm -hmm. and being very flexible. Yeah,、um, there, there's a word for that. It's called social bricolage. Yeah, I just learned it recently. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? Social bricolage. Bricolage, as in like do it yourself.、Uh, okay. So just clever little hacks. Yeah. But apparently,、uh, it's a thing in in theory.、Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm reassured. If it's in theory, then I'm reassured.、Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is maybe a question you won't like, but、mm -hmm. to what extent, you know, is a lot of this dependent on you、mm -hmm. as a person and、mm -hmm. that particular biography、mm -hmm. and background and you know set of values and and assumptions、mm -hmm. that you. Oh, I like、That's、this you... question.、Um, so I think、uh, less and less is my answer. Yeah,、okay. yeah. So at the moment, I guess still quite a bit, but less and less. Why so?、Uh, because we've got Shu Yang here, right?、Okay. <laughs> if I get if I get hit by the bus, I'm ninety nine percent sure that she'll be able to to continue this Taoistic way of not doing. So, so、uh, I mean, so glad it's ninety nine percent. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other one person to say you also get hit by a bus, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> because we may be on the same bus, you know. Um, so an uh, air bus um, bind, bound for New York, for example. So, so what I'm trying to say is that um, th this particular way of not dealing, uh, it takes a lot of unlearning. <laughs> but, but I think there's a lot of people in the community kind of already very far along on this way of unlearning. Um, and so at, at some point, I think it would just be a accepted way of, of not doing things. Yeah. What, uh, what do you think about this question, Shu Yang? <laughs> to what, yeah. do you, what degree does this still you know, depend a lot on Audrey? Um, we depend a lot on the transcription uh, of Audrey. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. it's very important yes. to have yes. all everything transparent so we can read everything through. And Audrey speaks very fast. So that helps a lot, uh, and also not not only Audrey's opinion. Actually, every meeting we transcribed uh, has been very helpful oh, yeah. on like learning and relearning, on learning everything. Mm -hmm. So I think Audrey does contribute a lot, kind of a big portion of all things we're working on right now. Uh, doesn't matter in the in the no matter in the government or or in 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 the community, mm -hmm. but um, but. Um, I think what's very variable uh, is actually every uh, the knowledge we kind of collect every moment we have meetings and kind of bump into brainstorming sessions with everyone we talk with. And so it's spreading, is what she was saying. It's mm -hmm. spreading. <laughs> um, what's the is there sort of a next generation of leaders that you participate that you're a part of, Shu Yang? Like, is there is there like mm -hmm. five, six other people, you know, who feel... Oh, yeah, they have a lot of circles, mm -hmm. like some good friends of open government or whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, who, who are the people I also find as smart as Audrey? <laughs> <laughs> no, your colleagues, your colleagues. <laughs> My colleagues, yeah, there's yeah. so many other people in, in the team, um... Mm their uh, extended network also internationally. Um, especially in the V-Taiwan network, we have this V network going on right now. Mm. So people from New York, people from Japan are also joining and there's also a French embassy in Japan. They're also kind of just found out V-Taiwan from Japan and then linked to Taiwan. So they are now also trying to copy V-Taiwan to V-Japan, V-France, yeah. V-New York. So yeah, and, and also our friend Ed Nesta, who has been spreading it in the UK and, and so on, yeah. 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 Um, but within Taiwan, like I, the reason I'm asking is there's there's often this um, this tension mm -hmm. in in any self managing system mm -hmm. where you know you, you don't rely on leadership in a traditional way, mm -hmm. as you were saying, um, mm -hmm. a particular way of not doing things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yet the reality is that a system very much depends on a number of people stepping forward mm -hmm. and feeling. Ownership and you know and bring their particular history and skills and mm -hmm. um, and so systems like this can also very quickly you know fall flat or you know get see mm -hmm. their energy drained mm -hmm. uh, if there aren't the right people who mm -hmm. step forward and energize the system. That's right. That's uh, right. Yeah, that that's why the mini hackathon kind of rotates chairs and rotates processes and and I think at least. Half a dozen people now can can easily chair uh, a whole veto and process for a single case, yeah. Mm. And they're they're not public servants, right? So, and within PDS, there's more people, yeah. What are what are things that you're thinking about that nobody ever asks you a question about? So I, hmm? You know, I, 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 the other day I read everything that Tom, uh, Tom Atley, you know, wrote about mm. Vita. I've, I've listened to mm -hmm. quite a few YouTube talks and stuff, but I'm, I'm just curious, what are, mm -hmm. what are things that people like me don't see mm -hmm. in what you guys are trying to do? Come, Shu Yang asked me some difficult questions. <laughs> he wants to <laughs> hear difficult questions. <laughs> Are you happy? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty happy. I'm content even. <laughs> um, not not quite joyful, but, but pretty happy. Yes. Thank you for asking. <laughs> mm, difficult questions. Mm. Not difficult, but yeah. just things that that you guys are busy with that for you make an integral part of 
you know the, the things that you're working on and that typically outsiders don't understand or don't see well the, the, um, the thing is that we have new interns all the time in, in Peters and and Vita and also has newcomers all the time so we get asked newbie questions all the time <laughs> and they get pretty well documented so so it's, it's not like a a cabal <laughs> where there's only uh, four old people <laughs> um, and then it's it's constantly rotating so so uh, I think a lot of thing in Vita one is just fresh people bringing fresh pairs of eyes yeah, yeah I think most Journalists uh, do ask uh, very, very good questions. Um, it actually depends on people. Actually, it depends on how much material, how many material they've uh, read uh, already before they ask. But I think most of the time, I found it very valuable uh, answering questions because just give you another point of view and looking at the project from a different different point of view. Mm -hmm. And I do can. Um, Kind of try to compare Vita One or PO network with other systems in other countries. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very the very as well. Has has any of this percolated at local levels? Like I, mm -hmm. you know, I've recently looked at some places. Like there's, you know, two municipalities in France that do really interesting things, and I'm mm -hmm. I want. Um, yeah, yeah. The the e petition system in Taipei City, in particular, is more advanced than the national one. Uh, they have a binding i voting at the end of it, which is a lot like referendum, and it's done over the internet. Uh, and uh, there's many participatory budget uh, processes being um, experimented in Taichung and New Taipei City as well. Um, I think um, w what I'm trying to say is that uh, the V Taiwan like ethos. Um, to the wider public administration uh, is not about this particular bunch of people, but about that it can work in the first place, and and that uh, such internet enabled tools they can be cheap and cheerful in the sense that you don't have to adopt the whole process; you just adopt, adopt some part of it, like um, mm -hmm. Slido or Polis or whatever. They all get individually used uh, in in a network of other democratic uh, inventions or interventions. So, yeah, we, we do see a lot of that in the, um, in the city level. And e even at the community level, we see a lot of adoption as well. Yeah. Um, a whole different question that just pops up. Um, I, I'm always curious in, in participatory processes of, you know, how, how could we get voices of wisdom Mm. into the room beyond the people that are there you know people mm -hmm. how can you know get the, the voice of mm -hmm. of the planet of future generations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. of elders of um, mm -hmm. um, of native people you know how, how um, it's something that we've completely lost in modernity mm -hmm. right we, we with the here and now and mm -hmm. the, you know, the people who are in the room mm -hmm. and I, I, I wish that this, this is something that you've been concerned about, um, yes. And and how so? Um, <laughs> what, what more do you want me to say? I mean, um, for 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 our collaborative meetings, we have been considering uh, the the benefit of the fish, the the ecology of the sea, right? That that is one very deep case we explored over seven meetings or something. There's a case where we uh, talk about the right of the uh, babies born to single mothers who choose to use artificial insemination. And again, that is about future generation and a future soci sociology or society. Uh, we talk about the benefit of animals who suffered cruelty, but, but there's no uh, police well-trained to rescue them, nor um, animal uh, help us who are qualified as a kind of police. Right? So that's about um, animals, uh, welfare, animal rights. Um, there's many cases in our discussions where the main stakeholders are have not yet been born, or is born but is not equipped to talk, uh, or 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 maybe equipped to talk but not in a language that human can understand. <laughs> so so we we did deal with with such cases. Um, I wouldn't say with ease, but but with with ways uh, of essentially have spokespeople um, who who try to speak for 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 the fish, uh, for the animals. 
for the unborn children and and in in various different perspectives and I think the beauty of it is that um for those cases where we're able to reach i would say on average higher quality deliberation because people are not very deliberative if they think about self interest but if they think mostly about the interest of stakeholders that are not human beings or not not yet human beings uh then then I think the quality become much more selfless and people are able to um converge on consensus even if they start very differently and that cannot be said by people who only speak about self interest So you had people who stepped up forward as spokespeople who fit, who felt yes a strong connection. That's right. So people people from NGOs or people from or just yeah or you know, from the academia. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hmm. Thank you very much. I uh, hmm. I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I know it's very late for you guys. And, and it is. Yeah. Um, digesting everything I. Um, you guys have shared with me. Um, mm. Yeah, hope that's helpful. Helpful. Mm. Yes, it is. It is extremely. It's extremely helpful. Um, yeah, I. Um, I feel like I've received so much that I part of me that feels like I want to re reciprocate, but I wouldn't. I. I don't know how I would. Oh, you you you, you, you can you can you can just say you know uh, I allow the part that has Audrey in it to be released to YouTube as a Creative Commons video. <laughs> of course. I, uh... <laughs> okay. Well, has Shuyang been recording? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I recorded after after you joined. Uh, okay, I have um, a copy of everything since I joined. So oh, so, yeah, so, okay. so if you're okay with it, we'll just release it. So I thank you on okay. behalf yeah. of the the humankind who can go to YouTube at least a fraction of humankind that can access YouTube. <laughs> Seventeen people who will watch this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Have yeah. a have a good local time. Yeah. <laughs> a good day. And good night to you. And thank you, Sir Shu Yang, also for uh, all the time that we've spent together on this. Um, if I, no, it's been it's been lovely. Yeah. It's been I, very uh, nice to, to talk to you. If I um, if I have some more questions, I uh, I will come back to bother you. Um, of course, of course, <laughs> come bother me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, bye cheers. Bye. bye bye. Have a good day. Good good night. A good local time. <laughs> okay. Bye. -bye. <laughs>